Hello and welcome to today's Office Hours session. This is your host, Paul Hoyt. Our Office Hours is a relaxed, informal mentoring program for tribe members. We hold every Monday at noon Pacific time. All these recording slides and exercises are archived in the members area of our website. We've been talking for months about switching Office Hours to where it was a paid service, and we're in the process of doing that right now. So be, be ready for some emails and for some announcements on on costs and fees and things associated with uh, attending these office hours broadcasts and having access to our library. That'll be coming up in the next couple of weeks. The reasons we do these office hours programs is because we know that being a successful small business owner can be a great experience, but we also know that it's tough. You really need support to be successful and we want you to get to know us because first and most importantly, we want you to know that we do care about you. We want you to be successful in every area of life, whatever that means to you. We want you to find the greatness, the happiness, the divinity within yourself, and then remember it and embrace it every single day as we try to do. Our passion is helping entrepreneurs and small business owners get clear, stay focused, and grow faster. And we do that by talking to them about the seven key performance areas of business that I that I defined in my book in 2004 called The Foundation Factor. Um, and in these, and today specifically, we're going to talk about marketing. Um, I want to start the conversation out there, but as we get to, into the office hours uh, discussion today, if you want to ask questions or offer discussion topics from any of, of the other key performance areas, you're welcome to do so. We also have invented and created the Awakened CEO system, which essentially tells people to focus on these nine things. First of all, the three levels of performance with mindset, methods, and momentum, and the three areas of growth, business growth, professional growth, and personal growth. And I'm going to come back to this diagram here in just a minute as it relates to marketing. Today's agenda is we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to me in order to be great at marketing. We're going to jump into open Q&A and coaching, and then we've got some special offers and some special programs that we'll be announcing, oh, about halfway through or two-thirds of the way through the program today. First of all, let's talk just a little bit about what it means to be great at marketing. First of all, being great at marketing to me means being diligent at market research. And frankly, this is one of the areas where many of my clients and colleagues you know, fall down. We fail to do our market research. We think that we know what the market wants. We think we know what the market needs. We create our products and services and we take them to market without really asking the market what it is that they want and need and how much they're willing to pay for it. That to me is the biggest challenge in marketing and the biggest area in which people need to shift their mindset. More on that in just a second. Second issue about marketing or uh, subject area for marketing is creating a powerful brand. You know, something that's memorable, something that describes the products and services you're doing, maybe, or maybe it's just a, a no-nonsense word like Google or Kleenex or Xerox was, you know, in those early days. The one that mo strikes me most recently is when you think of hotels, think of Tribago. Well, nobody's ever heard of Tribago. I have no idea where they came up with that word, but they spent millions of dollars in advertising turning the word Tribago into a brand for their company about finding great hotel, hotel deals. Third thing that you have to do to be great at marketing is claim your position in the marketplace. Know exactly how you want to position yourself in the marketplace, who your target markets are, you know, what market segments, what industries you're going to pursue, um, and who you want to be seen as being like, and who you want to be seen as not being like, and who do you want to you know, take pictures with, with your arms around them, or share trade show booths, or something like that. You're positioning with people and positioning against people. Um, you do that, you know, and determine your target markets at the same time, and then create very clear and effective messages that communicate the problem that you are solving, the value that you're seeking to bring to your, to your clients and your customers, you know, how you are different from your competitors, why people should pay attention to you, credibility statements, those sorts of things. That's all part of being great at marketing. And these days, it's developing a great website, too. Um, 
you know, I remember back when websites first started coming out in 1995, and I remember talking to people about year 2000 of saying, we finally come to the point to where you'd have to have a website for your business um, in the same way that people needed to have an, a listing in the yellow pages and a business card and a phone number. You know, that was 15, 16 years ago when that happened. And now, gosh, if you don't have a great domain name, if you don't have a website, you're just considered you're hardly in business at all. Um, so it is imperative if you're going to be great at marketing for you to have a great internet presence and that all starts with your domain name and your website. It's also essential that you create quality printed material and by the way that your printed material and your website and all the material you put out is very consistent because you don't want to confuse people by delivering one message on your website and delivering a different message through your printed material. Being great at marketing is all these things, but wait, there's more. Being great at marketing also means being able to design and implement effective lead generation campaigns. Now, it is oftentimes the case to where salespeople are required to generate their own leads, but for most businesses, the marketing department at that business or the marketing function of that business takes primary responsibility for lead generation campaigns. And I notice I say campaigns because you want to have more than one. You want to have lead generation campaigns across multiple media. For example, you might have email campaigns and print campaigns and networking campaigns and affiliate campaigns and social media campaigns and TV, radio and print advertising campaigns. But it's your responsibility in the marketing department to design and implement effective campaigns in whichever media you decide to do it. Marketing departments should also manage the development of products and services. If you have an inventor-centric business or product-centric business, it's really hard to tell engineers and, and uh, inventors that you, know, you shouldn't be running the show. You shouldn't be the one that decides on what features and benefits to put into your products and services. You should be relying on marketing professionals to tell you that, but that's the truth. That's the way that most very, very successful businesses do it. It's their marketing people who are responsible for product development, product development life cycles, and, um, and they direct the activities of the inventors and the engineers to create solutions that they know the marketplace will want to buy. It's also imperative these days that you be great at social media. Um, I think we have reached the point, in fact, I think we reached the point a few years ago, that in order to be effective in marketing these days, you have to be effective at social media. You have to have not just an internet presence, but a social media presence, a presence in Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Pinterest, you know, Instagram, there are lots of different social media outlets out there and it is important for you to have a decent social media presence because there's an entire generation of people who are 35 and below say who that's their life, that's the way they get all of their information. They don't watch news on TV, they may not go to news internet sites like CNN.com or MSNBC.com um, they may not go to those sites, or usatoday.com, which is one of my favorites. They may not do that at all. They may get all of their information from social media. And of course, Facebook is trying to take over the entire world when it comes to social media with the new Facebook Live app, live streaming app capability. You know, I think pretty soon that their goal is to get rid of TV and cable altogether and just be able to get any type of news we want, any type of activity, any type of entertainment that we want, all through the Facebook portal. So it's essential that we be good at social media these days. It's also essential that you develop and manage great relationships with affiliates and alliance partners. That is the function of the marketing department. It was my pleasure for a few years to be a senior consultant at a firm that did channel marketing consulting. We worked with very large companies like Oracle and NCR and Macromedia and CDW to go in and analyze the activities they had in their channel marketing departments and do audits of them and then make recommendations as to how they could increase their effectiveness, their sell-through ratios by having different programs with different sets of marketing partners. 
And last on this list, but certainly not last when it comes to all of the different things that we do in marketing, is to work with the sales and engineering people. As it turns out with very large companies, there's oftentimes an adversarial relationship in between the marketing and the sales people or the marketing and the engineering people. There's an adversarial relationship between marketing and sales because you know, sales is, ch is challenged and chartered with making quota. And oftentimes they say, you know, well, you know, the reason I'm not making quota is because those darn marketing people aren't giving me enough high quality leads. And this internet sucks and, and our website sucks and our marketing material sucks. And they blame their lack of success on the marketing department. So there's oftentimes an adversarial relationship between those two. And we talked earlier about marketing needing to actually direct the activities of the engineering department. And a lot of times the engineers, I've seen engineering and marketing rather, you know, not cooperate all that well when it came to developing new products and services and had to you know, take it up a notch to the CEO level in order to be able to do that. So those are, you know, at a high level, marketing is, you know, these six things, branding and messaging, branding and positioning rather, target markets, industries, market segments, messaging, figuring out what messages you're going to deliver and how you're going to deliver them, lead generation campaigns through a wide variety of sources, really understanding your target market and doing market research. Um, under managing the activities of the inventors and the engineers through product management and managing your alliances and partnerships. We're going to come back to this slide here in just a second, but I want to talk about marketing in the context of the awakened CEO system for a second. So, you know, we oftentimes talk about how necessary it is to focus on business growth, professional growth, and personal growth and focus on mindset, methods, and momentum. And here's what this means in marketing. In marketing, marketing is absolutely essential to your business growth. So from a mindset point of view, it's real important that you understand the role of marketing and the value of marketing. And when you think about growing your business, think about doing it via more effective marketing first and then sales, and then product development. But it's really all about marketing, about understanding the needs and wants of the marketplace, and about being able to design products and services and experiences and training education products that will actually meet those needs and wants and verify that even before you create the product. That's a real mindset to really understand the value of the marketing department, understand that it is, in my belief, the second most important of all of the key performance areas. The first one being leadership. We talked about that last week. Second one is marketing. From a professional growth point of view, you have to keep on pace with marketing because it's constantly changing. And from a professional growth, you have to be, you have to learn what you need to learn in order to keep up to date in marketing and realize we're constantly having to reinvent ourselves and learn more and more different things about marketing. And from a personal growth point of view, you have to make the decision that you're going to do whatever it takes in the area of marketing in order to be successful in marketing. Likewise, from a methods point of view, we have to design and implement the methods, the way by which we're going to implement marketing in our company. We have to know that we're going to continually revise that with our professional growth. And we have to de design ways to help us overcome any blocks and obstacles we might see as we develop and implement new marketing campaigns. And momentum, it's the same in all of these areas. We want you to get into action. We want you to design and implement new marketing campaigns and then do it repeatedly over time to build up the momentum and build up the momentum by which you gain professional competence in the area of marketing and build up the momentum by which you determine what blocks you might see within yourself and with other members of your team and find ways to overcome those more and more quickly over time. So the mindset of the marketeer is dramatically different than the mindset of the inventor or the engineer. And we may talk about that a little bit more when we get into the discussion. But let's jump into the discussion thinking about that. Here as a reminder are some of the very interesting things that that marketing people must do, and of course, 
if you are at a company and you're the CEO and it's a solo preneur or there's only two or three or four of you at the company, somebody's got to be really, really good at marketing. And oftentimes that means, by the way, that you have to outsource the marketing function to other people um, and to find quality marketing resources to assist you because, um, and I know I talk about this in the Awaken CEO Foundations class, but the, to be competent in marketing is, is a real challenge. It's a challenge because of mindset and it's a real challenge because of experience. Very large companies have marketing departments and it's hard to break into the marketing company department. Smaller companies hire outside sources in marketing, so it's hard to learn about marketing from them. It's just hard to be good at marketing. I think more than any other department at a company, it is hard when you're working for somebody else to develop competence in marketing. And what that means is when you jump out into business for yourself, it means that oftentimes and mostly people who jump out into business for themselves nine times out of ten don't have the marketing expertise that they need to be competent at marketing. And that's one of the big reasons why businesses are challenged and struggle you know, so much. So with that, I'm going to um, open it up for questions. We have a few questions and I've had a few um, you know, situations with clients over the last few weeks that I can talk about specifically. But we do want to hear from you. So if you're on the call today, um, you know, please, you know, type a question into the chat log or a discussion topic into the chat log and we'll come to you first. We'll come to those people first who are live online on the call because we want this to be an interactive call and we want you to get the value out of this call. And then we go to, you know, some topics that I want to talk about and some email questions that we've gotten as well. So with that, I've got, am joined again today by Stephanie May and I'm delighted to have her on the call today assisting me. She's got a little bit of a list of some of the questions that have come in and some that came in from other emails too. So Stephanie, um, lead on. What shall we talk about next? Okay. I'm going to start <clears throat> with this one because it's one that you and I have been um, uh, talking about very frequently lately. It seems like internet marketing is getting tougher and tougher. Is that true? Well, it certainly is true from my perspective. And here's the perspective that I've got. I remember working with a client about four or five years ago, and they wanted to try to develop an online membership community, and they wanted to develop a list, and they wanted to develop you know, an Internet presence with their own tribe and community. And they, <clears throat> we had some advisors on the call who were doing that for very large Fortune 1000 companies. And their message to us at the time was, if you want to develop an online membership community of a thousand people or more, be prepared to spend a two million dollars and for it to take about 18 months. Well, holy mackerel, you know, none of us thought that we certainly didn't have two million dollars and we didn't want to take, want it to take 18 months. So we thought, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that that's what was going on. But very large companies, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, are spending that kind of money you know, in their social media, in their internet marketing efforts. Maybe a lot more than that. I have a friend who just went on a marketer's cruise with probably a couple of hundred other people who are making their money on selling products and services, typically information products and services, you know, online. And there are dozens, if not hundreds, of people out there who have 10,000, 30,000, 50,000, 100,000, even a million dollars a month in their social media and internet advertising budgets. They find a particular Facebook ad, a Google ad, a LinkedIn ad, an approach in YouTube, something that works for them. And once they have cracked the marketing equation, of knowing that I put a quarter in the slot machine and I get out a dollar every time. And by the way, that is the goal, at least, is that we want a four to one return on revenues for our marketing investments. But they realize that once they crack the code, they just keep putting money in the slot and they keep putting money in the machine. So that means that you and I are competing against Eben Pagan, Frank Kern, Brendan Burchard, Tony Robbins, you know, all kinds of people who have 
hundred thousand dollar or more marketing budgets. So whenever we look for our share of the activity, we have to be really novel. We have to be unique. We have to stand out. We have to you know, follow the lead. And it takes a long time to build up a social media presence and to you know, gather your own tribe and your own community. I started years ago. Years ago in that I started posting an energy of the day message every day. Um, and I have every day for the last 1,160 days. That's three and a half years. So every day for three and a half years, I've been active on social media and publishing a blog. Um, I've got, you know, about 100 hours worth of videos available on YouTube. Lots and lots of things. So my best advice to you is, yes, internet marketing is getting more and more difficult. Yes, you are competing with a lot of people. And the time to start is right now to build up your library of content and to develop your particular style in working with your community um, so that you can attract the interest of the people who, who you're connected to. So yeah, it is getting tougher and it's really important for you to, uh, to get started and to, and to be very consistent over time. Next question, Steffi. <clears throat> All right, next question. Let's see, what is the best way to improve my marketing skills in social media? I, you know, I think absolutely the best thing to do, there's two approaches here. I just came up with a second. The, the, so I'll give you the second one first. So the second one first is to watch what other people are doing on social media. You know, subscribe to their lists, see what their emails are coming through, look at their groups and their fan pages, and see what they're doing in terms of uh, posting on Facebook and LinkedIn and other sorts of things. You know, try to follow the leader. Find somebody whose success that you want to emulate and do what they do. You know, if they're sending out emails on a daily basis, then you send out emails on a daily basis. If they're posting to Facebook four times a day, then you post to Facebook four times a day. Now take a look at the market leaders and assume they know what they're doing because if it's really working for them, there's a good chance that it's going to work for you as well. Uh, and that, by the way, is really important to keep your finger on the pulse of social media activity because it changes so often and so much. But the first answer to that question is hire a social media consultant. Make sure that you've got somebody on your team who can guide you, can advise you through that, somebody whose profession it is to keep their finger on the pulse of what's happening in social media and get their advice. You know, hire them if, if it's a few hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month, you know, go out and get their advice and then do what they say. And by the way, my, uh, my suggestion is find somebody who's, who's young. You know, you, you, I can't, it's hard for me to think that somebody who's in their fifties and sixties could be a social media consultant an advisor, I guess they probably could, but it's really the kids that are in their 20s and 30s who I think are going to be the best social media advisors, especially if that's the generation that you want to reach with your programs. You know, if your programs are designed on the elder care market and you're really only interested in talking to people who are you know, 65 or 70 or 75, then maybe it's not too much important to you. But I tell you, if you drop down to 55, it is important to you because one of the largest growing segments in all the social media is women, you know, 35 to 65 years old. They want to get online and keep in touch with their families and their children and their friends. And, you know, so if you want to reach them, you have to have social media expertise as well. So those two things, see what other people are doing and as best you can follow the leader. But the first thing I recommend is get a social media consultant on your team and listen to what they have to say and follow their guidance and advice. Hopefully that was, that was helpful to you. And we know some good ones. We've got a good social media consultant on the call today. And I know, I know some other ones who are in the industry as well. So we'll be happy to help you out with some recommendations if we can. Um, next question or topic, Stephanie. Okay. Um, we got a comment from Marcel who says that those energy of the days that um, that she'd like to see that in a downloadable workbook. I would love to, to have a conversation about that with you. I think that there's, there's certainly a mountain of content. My number one problem, by the way, 
I do not consider myself to be an expert at marketing. There's a big difference in between knowing theory of marketing and really getting it from a mindset point of view. And by the way, I think I have that. But when it comes to the tactics of marketing, of designing and implementing effective lead generation campaigns, monetizing the mountain of content that I come that, that I have, you know, I look to other people. I look to their advice to help me do that. Um, and that's probably the single most single largest area of my business where I do you know, go out and hire other people to help me with that area of business. So, you know, anytime somebody has an idea about how I can turn this mountain of content that I've created over the last 16 years as a business consultant into greater revenues and profits for me, I am all ears. Thank you very much for that comment. I appreciate it. Next, Steffi. Okay. Um, do I really have to do selfies and live videos to be successful? I really don't want to do that. I'm I'm a private person and don't want to do that. Yep. Um, so so selfies and you know I'm kind of a private person too, and and I'm you know kind of disclosing my age here a little bit. But goodness gracious, about the last thing I think about doing is taking a selfie of myself and and posting it on Facebook. But I think this comes right into what I talked earlier about mindset with marketing. Remember when I said that when it comes to personal growth and marketing, sometimes that means we have to get out of our own way and posting stuff online and being more transparent and being more authentic. And if that means a selfie of you and you and your wife or you and your, your husband, you know, out at dinner sometime just to try to develop a personal connection with people, then that's what you got to do. I'm still not very good at it, but at least I've gotten to the point to where I recognize that it's something that I need to do. The last thing I did, by the way, which I think was really successful, was when uh, Christmas holiday was here, I had family over, and over a course of three days, we worked a 2,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. And I was thinking ahead enough to where I took a picture when we took it out of the box, I took a picture when we were, you know, one-fourth the way done and half the way done and three-fourths the way done and created a photo collage and put it up on Facebook that I'd created over a period of two or three days. Now, those weren't selfies, but it was, you know, a way of me capturing something that's going on in my personal life and then sharing it online to develop a personal connection with other people. And it worked really well. I got like, you know, 70, 80, 100 likes and lots of comments and, um, you know, I think that's what we have to do these days. Now, I, whether you have to do it or not is another question. I think it's really advantageous to do it, to develop personal connections on social media platforms, um, much more so on Facebook than on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I think it's a lot about articles. It's not about selfies. Um, but there are a lot of social media platforms out there that require you to be transparent and open and invite people into your life, you know, as if they were your best friend or if, as if they were, you know, your roommate and living in the house with you. And, um, I, you know, I think that's, that's something that people, you, I strongly consider, I always suggest that you consider doing it. You know, start out with one selfie a week, then maybe move up to two or three a week you know, and just make it real, you know, share joy that you've had in your life, share something that you really love to do, share little minor accomplishments. You know, I went for a walk today and it was really beautiful and I saw this great tree and here's a picture of it. You know, I went for a drive in the country and I, you know, I saw this beautiful field of flowers. Share things in your life that bring you enjoyment with the intention and the attitude of not saying, look at me, I'm cool. But rather, I hope this brings you enjoyment too, can be a really effective way of opening up and sharing yourself with other people. Um, so you don't have to do it, but I strongly recommend that you do it. Uh, next question, Stephanie. All right. In, in the Lean Startup, mm -hmm. they talk about the value hypothesis tests, whether a product or service delivers value to the customer once they are using it. As customers value 
change quickly today given social media? How do you know or gauge when it's time to do another test? Well, that is a great question, Michael. Um, and this is just an off the top of my head answer, but I'm guessing, you know, every six months, every year, it really depends on the volatility of market. You might start out doing a, a, a survey, you know, every three months or so. Um, I, I've always recommended that you do a third party survey once a year. You know, once a year you hire an outside firm and ask them to go after your customer base and talk to the last 20 people that you've worked with and get their ideas on products and services that you might do or ways that you might tweak your product. You know, ask the, the four big questions about, you know, what can I add to the product? You know, what can I take out to the product? What would you like more of? What would you like less of? You know, four really good questions to ask about uh, 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 to your customers. And the reason I suggest doing it with a third party is that people will tell other people things that they won't tell you. You know, if, if, if you call them up, if I pick up a, the phone and call somebody and say, hey, this is Paul, it's great to talk to you. Um, is there anything that sucks about my products? You know, the odds of them being honest with me, I don't think are very good because I, I think it's far easier for somebody to, to give you direct feedback, especially the feedback that you really want to hear, you know, when they're talking to somebody else, because we have such a non-confrontational, a confrontation averse society today. So I would say at least once a year, and if you get this kind of this thought about, hey, I just put out a new product or service, or we just tweaked it in some way, now it's time for me to go out, you know, 30 days later after the launch, 60 days after the launch, and find out whether people are really using it, whether they really value it, whether they thought it was as cool or as beneficial as I thought it was, I think that's a pretty good idea too. And judging from the, the knowledge that you have about your marketplace, you know, and how accurate you, you prove to be after you've done the surveys, you can judge when that next survey should come out, whether you can wait six months to do the next one because you feel like, I really do understand what my customer needs and wants and the value they see in my products and services or whether you need to you know, do it more often than that because your survey indicates that you really don't know how they're using your products and services. That was a great question. I really, really appreciate that, Michael. I'm going to take just a quick time out here today because I want to share a little bit with you about some of the things that are going on here at Hoyt Management Group a little bit. Um, First of all, our next office hours is on January 30th, a week from today. We're going to do live group coaching. That's the recurring theme for 2017. It's just open discussions with tribe members who have subscribed to the membership area or have, you know, some of them have been have purchased lifetime uh, memberships or been granted lifetime memberships as a bonus for some of the larger packages that they, that they purchased. So we are starting very quickly only doing office hours and this event, you know, the, the conversation we're having today with members of our tribe. And we're going to continue doing live group coaching for a while. Let me know what topics you'd like for me to address. If you want me to do another presentation, I'm happy to do that. Go to paulsurvey.com and put that out. As I announced uh, last week or the week before, I created a new venture with a business partner of mine, Paz Simpson. He's my twin brother from Harlem and it's around racial intelligence. I invite you to be friends with us on Facebook and join the racial intelligence movement to cure racism. I'm going to do anything and everything that I can to help people see beyond the superficial characteristics of people, see beyond the color of their skin, the language and the accent that they have, the clothes that they wear, and look into their eyes and see the heart of other people. And when you see the heart of other people, you'll see that they're just like you and your family, and I think we can do a lot to end that, and that's my mission for 2017. I appreciate your support. We've also got, you know, a package that we are rebranding, and you are the first people to hear about this today, but we are rebranding a product that we've had, and we're calling it the No BS Business Growth Package. I'm really excited about that. The reason we're calling it the No BS Business Growth Package is twofold. Number one, it is no BS. We really want you to grow your business. This is a simple, very effective way 
to get very clear, stay focused so that you can grow faster. This is a four-part program. Part one is the business clarity questionnaire. Part two is the phase growth strategy or your strategic long-term plan. Start th part three is a business foundation profile, your gap analysis to tell how you are doing relative to what you need to be doing in order to be successful. And step four is the 90-day growth plan, which is what allows you to stay focused in your business. We're calling it the no BS package because it is no BS. It is right down the business. It is exactly what most companies need to help them get very clear and get, get unstuck and, and deal with the struggles and the challenges that they have in their businesses. Uh, we also call it an OBS because that's what the younger generation really looks for. The younger generation who's used to Facebook and selfies and Twitter and all of that is, is a generation which is ingrained in authenticity and integrity. I mean, they are the what I consider the no BS generation. They don't want people to put on errors and superficial aspects of things. They, they, they take pictures of themselves when they're not dressed up and they don't have much makeup on to just show that they're real. They're really focused on being real, and we are too. And that's why we're calling it the no BS package. The no BS package has a list price of $1,500. That's not the price that you're going to pay. I'll talk to you about a couple other things before I do that. First of all, um, the package comes with a 100% money back guarantee. If you don't want to continue after the first session, we're going to give you an absolute complete refund for everything. So you're not at risk at all after the first session. If you get through the first session and go through the entire program, I'm giving another guarantee, and this is fairly unique. And that is, if you get to the end of the program and you don't agree with the package was worth every penny that you paid for it, then you set the price. You tell me how much it was worth to you. You you just say that you know this was this was only worth you know five hundred dollars, or this was only worth twelve hundred dollars, or this was only worth fifteen hundred dollars. What I believe most strongly is that you will get to the end of it and you'll say, wow, this was worth many thousands of dollars. You know, I'm in business for myself. I'm spending $5,000 a month on my burn rate just to keep the doors open to take care of my personal financial needs. And you accelerated my growth at least 90 days, and that's worth $15,000, 10 times what you nominally paid for it. That's what I really believe is going to happen. But if that doesn't happen with you, I am 100% committed to you getting the value that you really want out of this system. So I encourage you to just call and schedule a three strategy session today. Learn about discounts in businesses. I said that $1,500 wasn't the price that you're going to pay. It's not because we offer discounts and bonuses, and it changes all the time depending upon your situation. So call today. Learn more about the program. We're happy to share with you, you know, what price you might enjoy for a system that I think is absolutely going to knock your socks off. And with that, I want to go back into questions and answers about marketing first and then, again, opening it to anything else that you want to talk about. Stephanie. Yep. You ready? Mm -hmm. I am. How do I decide which markets to go after? Good question. Why do I decide which markets to go after? You know, the, the approach that I always recommend is we find pain in the marketplace. We find a problem in the marketplace that is not being effectively resolved or managed by all of the other different options that people have. You know, here's an example of a market that you don't want to pursue. You go to a food court, and in the food court, you know, every 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 position in the food court gets jammed. They've got eight different offerings. For you to think about coming into that food court and offering something new, you know, that's not a national franchise, is probably not a good idea because the competition is extremely high. It's an incredible red ocean. What we want to look for is blue oceans. And by the way, I did an office hours presentation on blue ocean strategy. You know, you want to look for a blue ocean out there, which is a way for you to address a problem in the marketplace that nobody else is addressing effectively or as effectively as you can address it. You know, there's no taco stand within 10 miles. Maybe it's a good idea to put a taco stand on a well-traveled corner. 
uh, because there is no competition that's anywhere close to you. Um, or, you know, people aren't doing it in the way that you thought that they could, or you're offering a unique approach to something, and you're able to get that out there. If you can be unique in the marketplace, if you can be better, faster, or cheaper, or more convenient than other people, and you see that pain and the opportunity to fulfill that pain, and jump through a window of opportunity, then that's the market that you want to go after. You want to find that market opportunity. You want to sell a mediocre cheeseburger a very, at a very expensive price to a starving person who has no other options, right? You want to find the pain and address it before anybody else does or in a way that nobody else can. That's a very good way to, to choose your market. Here's another really good way to choose your market, and that is start with the why. Start with your reason for being in the first place, your reason for being in business, your reason for doing business, your reason for wanting to serve people. There are a lot of people out there who are called in some way. You know, They might have actually had a dream and got a calling from the Archangel Gabriel who came down and said, you know, you need to be doing this. I have talked to people who said that. Or they've got a calling in another way. It just touches their heart in some way to reach out and help somebody. And because it touches their heart, it really taps into their creativity, taps into their inner personal resources, and they're able to work harder, work longer, come up with great ideas to help those people who have touched their heart in some way. And that's the market they need to serve. That, by the way, is my story. You know, when I started working with entrepreneurs and small business owners and people who wanted to have their own business 16 years ago, it just touched my heart. I've said many times to those of you listening, you know, I practically fell in love with every entrepreneur I've ever met because I love their spirit. I love that spunk that says, I'm going to give it a shot. You know, they're full of vim, vigor, and vitality, optimism, and anxiousness, and typically they don't have any idea what they're doing, and I know that I can help, and that's the market that I want to serve. So you find the market that you want to serve that really touches your why and gets you in touch with your passion, and then go do it and move heaven and earth to bring value to those people. That, I think, is the best way to choose a market. I, I like it with the method of the heart and the method of the head. The first one we talked about was a method of the head. And we're going to do it from a kind of a scientific, imperial, analytical point of view, but also do it from the heart. And when the heart and the head come together, when you see a market opportunity and it checks out up here and it checks out in here, that's when you want to really want to go for it. Great question. Next question or topic, Sherry, or Stephanie. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about working with alliance partners? Yeah, I can, because I, I, I think I mentioned this in the first part, is that I actually was worked with a company called Technology Channels Group, which was sold and acquired, it was acquired by another firm, you know, in 2008, I think it was, 2009. But I worked with them for a couple of years, and we went into very large companies, and we looked at all of their alliance partner and channel marketing programs. And that meant OEM partners, affiliates, consulting partners, people who had you know, a software that, that interacted with or interfaced with the software companies that we were working with, you know, people who are agents and brokers, value-added resellers. I mean, it, there are a lot of different forms and ways in which you can work with the alliance partners. Um, so I think that's probably message number one, is that there's a lot of ways to work with other companies. They can be, you know, sell-through partners. They can be technology partners. They can be marketing partners. They can be operations partners. So let's take each one of those. A marketing partner, partner might be somebody that you develop and execute marketing campaigns with. You put your product with their product. You create a better total solution. You develop a marketing brochure. You, you uh, land together at a trade show. You know, and you market your products and services together because your brands are consistent and your markets are the same 
and together you can provide value that you can't separately. A sales partner might be a firm that helps you sell your products and services. That can be an agent or a broker or a manufacturer's rep. It could be an affiliate partner, somebody that puts your stuff on their website and when somebody clicks through, you know, they take a percentage of the revenue that came from, from that. You know, that can be a, sales, a selling partner of yours. A technology partner can be somebody that you work with, you know, to help develop new technology. I remember back when I was living in Texas many, many years ago that there was a joint venture between IBM and Texas Instruments and somebody else to create a chip manufacturing facility. And it was jointly owned by the three of them. It was a classic joint venture, and they shared in the technology that came out of that R&D facility. And the fourth type of partnership is an operations partnership. So an operations partnership means that we're sharing office space or in some way we're working together to take care of the uh, general and administrative aspects of our business. And the one that is a classic from that is a dentist office where there's multiple dentists in a partnership or a doctor or doctors or, or an attorney's office is the one that I see a lot where you might have four or five attorneys have a common legal secretary and a receptionist but each one of them is individually running their own business and it's a cooperative overhead and administration kind of service that they run for each other so there's a lot of different ways to think about your marketing alliances and your, your partnerships and think about it on those four ways do we want a marketing alliance a sell-through alliance, a technology development alliance, or an operations alliance. And um, go out and find great people to work with. And there are a lot of great people out there. Find great people to work with who can facilitate the growth of your business and you can facilitate the growth of their business you know, through those partnerships. And of course, I've done office hours on marketing alliances and partnerships. I'm not sure what the name of it is, but you can look them up in the, in the, the tribe area on creating great uh, alliance partnerships and affiliate relationships. Next question. Okay. I'm an inventor and I just want to make products and then go sell them. Any advice for me? Yeah, listen to the marketing people. That would be my number one advice. Hardest thing to do, of course. I mean, every inventor for some reason, you know, I'm an inventor too of sorts, but my inventions are books. You know, I write poems, I write books, I, uh, I, you know, write songs and sing songs, and it's my creation. You know, it's my, it's, it's, you know, divinity coming through me out into the outside world, and it makes me feel oh so good to be expressive and to be creative. And in some way, my self-esteem and an inventor's or an engineer's self-esteem and self-image is impacted by people who love what we do. You know, we want to say, you know, here, this is my baby. This is my song. This is my poem. Don't you like it? Don't you like me because I created it? I mean, that's, that's, that's the attitude and the mindset. Of course, you know, being as, as old as I am and as hopefully wise as I am, I've overcome about 98% of that, you know, to where I put it out there and, and help people and I don't, I don't really care who likes it and who doesn't like it because I know that somebody's going to and, you know, I guess those were the people that was intended to serve. Um, but if you're an inventor or an engineer and you want to create a business out of it, take a look, listen to this statistic. Companies that are market driven, companies that listen to the marketplace that follow methodologies like the Lean Startup methodology, that validate the concept before they create the prototype, that validate the prototype before they go into low volume manufacturing, and validate all kinds of things before they ever get into high volume manufacturing, have about a 90% success rate. Inventors, engineers, creativity people have about a 2% success rate. In 1999, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the, the Inventors Protection Act of 1999, requiring people who provide services to inventors to publish the statistics about how successful their services were. And that's what we come up with. It's about 1 or 2%. About 1 or 2% of all the really good inventors 
ideas out there actually are commercially viable and become monetizable in the sense of being a product that sustains a business. So those are the odds. 90% to be a market-driven company, 2% if you're an inventor-driven company. So, you know, you do the math. If you want to start a business, then be a great inventor, but listen to the marketplace. You'll come up with your idea before you put $50,000 or $100,000 into it and six months or two years of your time into it. Ask people if your intention is really to sell it. If your intention is to create art and you don't care whether or not anybody likes it, and you don't really depend upon your art to make your living with, well then by all means create art and put it out there and God bless you, I hope everybody loves it. But if your intention is to create a business, if your intention is to create a business, then you know, listen to the market. That's what, that's what you need to do. Stephanie, are you still there? Can you hear me? I am. Good, I'm glad. We had somebody type in that they had lost the audio, so I want to make sure that everybody heard that that response. We get 12:53. I think we got time for maybe one or two more questions. Go for it. Here's a good one. Do you know where marketing is going? What media and what messages are next? Um, no, I don't. I mean, the short answer is no, but I absolutely don't know where marketing is going. But I can show you some trends that might help us both kind of think this through. So certainly marketing is going mobile because the world is going mobile. You know, the sales of laptops are down in comparison to the sales of smartphones. The size of smartphones are, are is up quite a bit. You know, the new iPhone 7 Plus, the iPhone 6S Plus, the Samsung Galaxy 5. You know, these are pretty large devices. They're almost as large as, you know, uh, devices of old days were for tablet p PCs or for Palm Pilots or, excuse me, iPads. You know, it's almost like your phone is the size of an iPad was even just a few years ago. So that's trend number one is the world is going mobile. Whatever you're doing in marketing, creating a website, creating a video, you know, whatever you are doing in marketing, plan to deliver your message on somebody's smartphone. You know, if it's a tiny little smartphone like the one that I still have or a larger smartphone, I think that's trend number one. Trend number two is short messages. You know, we used to say that you can only get, have people's attention for 10 or 15 minutes before they turn the channel. And then it went to like three or four or five minutes. And my marketing people are telling me now that, you know, videos need to be down about a minute or so for that first video or less. 30, 40, 50 seconds. If they liked it and clicked through, then you can share a four or five minute video maybe, you know, before you get into the 40 or 50 minute. I know that in my own life is that if I click on something online and it pops up with a video and they don't tell me how long the video is, I'd stop watching it immediately because I have no interest in watching a video that's going to be 10, 15, 20 minutes long, and I absolutely have no interest watching a video unless I know how long that video is. So that maybe that's just me, or maybe that's a trend in the marketplace. I think it's a trend in the marketplace. Shorter, more compact, as my friend Lisa Nichols says, clear, concise, powerful, and quick messaging. Short messages, short emails, although the long form sales letter still seems to be something that works, um, you know, I think its days are numbered. I think that we're going towards mobile devices and short messages. And I think the next trend would be in the area of authenticity and integrity. Not so much, you know, makeup and fashion as it is just real honest, you looking at me, me looking at you me telling you what's on my mind, you telling me what's on your mind. If I'm feeling great, I'm telling you I am feeling great. And if I'm not feeling so great, I'm saying, God, I'm going through a tough time. I'm spending a little bit of time in the shadows right now. What can you do to pick me up and perk me back up and get me back to my awesome place so I can serve people and live life in the way that I want to live life more and more and more often? But those, that's what I see for trends. Mold devices, short marketing messages, and authentic messages that are just real, which of course is why I created the No BS Business Growth Package. But I hope you all give me a call and we can talk more about how that can really help you 
get clear, stay focused, and grow faster. Um, any, did we have any more questions or any other comments you have? Stephanie, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, we have a comment from our, you know, from our own social media maven. She says, yes, mobile. I'm watching this webinar at home on a cell phone. And I think that that's something that, um, that's just so true. You know, it, it is mobile. It, it is the shorter messages. It is the authenticity. I think that, uh, that you're spot on. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Uh, any other questions or shall we close for the day? I think we're complete. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. I really want to thank everybody who tuned in and who's listening to this recording. Those of you who attended it live, who listened on the phone, who watched it on your cell phone. You know, thank you very much. I appreciate your kind attendance. Uh, come to back to us next week when we'll have another live group coaching session. And I may pick a theme. I like this idea of we talked about leadership last week. We talked about marketing this week. We're going to talk about something again next week that gives me a little bit of a theme to talk about. I really do appreciate that. You know, give us a call if we can support you in growing your business faster. I'm really key on you know this $1,500 package or less being able to deliver five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars worth of value. That's what I want for each and every one of you. I care about each and every one of you. I want you to be healthy and happy and successful in every area of your life. And until we meet again, this is Paul Hoyt and Stephanie wishing you a most marvelous and prosperous day. Bye-bye.